Hi there, welcome back. In this class, we continue our discussion about extreme value theory. We will introduce fundamental results like the fischer tippett theorem or the piquant balk madehan theorem. So the two theorems that relate to the generalized extreme value distribution and the generalized Pareto distribution. We will not enter into much uh, detail in the sense that we will not consider all the technicalities of the proofs because this is not the scope, the goal of this course. For that, I just refer you to the beautiful books that you find on the subject, like the book by Embrex, uh, Mikos and Kluppelberg, or the beautiful book by De Haan and Pereira, and two courses that are specifically on extreme value, value theory. Nevertheless, those results are fundamental, are pivotal for us, because they constitute the basis for all our quantitative analysis in the field of extreme value theory. So it is very important that we know at least the basic information for those fundamental uh, theorems. After that, at the end of the lesson, we will start introducing some practical tools, some plots, some heuristics that we can try to use in order to analyze the so-called fat tails. In fact, as we shall see for us in QRM, so in quantitative risk management, the most dangerous situation is the situation of fat tails. So we will define what probabilistically and statistically and formally a fat tail is. We will see that there is a lot of confusion, unfortunately, about this topic. So we will try to be precise and after that, I will try to teach you how to check for the presence of fat tails in your data. We will start in this lesson and then we will continue uh, next week in the, in the following class. Now, uh, what I want to do now is to introduce the basic results for what concerns the GV and the GPD, that is to say the fischer tippett and the piquant balkma de Haan theorems. So these theorems are fundamental tools for the analysis of extremes. Now, a very important thing that I want to stress is that, unfortunately, also for what concerns extremes, there is a little bit of confusion. You can listen to many people blabbering about black swans, saying that this is a black swan, that is a black swan, and they use a black swan as a synonym for an extreme event. Now, if you read the book by Nassim Taleb, which is something I strongly suggest, so the black swan, uh, you immediately discover that an extreme is not a black swan. There are fundamental differences. Unfortunately, a lot of people speak about things without reading and studying things first. Now, there is only one thing that is in common between an extreme event, as we have defined that, and a black swan. That is to say, the very important and large impact. So both an extreme event and a black swan, they have this very strong impact on our lives, on our portfolio, or whatever. But there is a fundamental difference. An extreme event is an event whose behavior can be modeled from a probabilistic point of view, because we know we have at least sufficient information to make inference about the tail, about the distribution that governs the event. We will see that Using EVT, we can try to classify the type of tail, and in a sense, we are able to elicit all the probabilities related to extremes. So we can actually make inference. In a black swan, conversely, we don't know anything about the probabilities because of many reasons, because of radical uncertainty, because of ambiguity, because of unknowledge, using the term of shekel, because of lack of whatever type of access to data and to information, we are not even able to elicit a probability. 
So there is nothing that we can do actually from a probabilistic point of view. Even more, when there is a black swan, the point is that ex ante, so before the black swan manifests itself, we cannot even think about the black swan. The example is the turkey that we saw in the turkey's fallacy. For the turkey, Thanksgiving is a black swan. It's something that is out of uh, its horizon because looking at the past, looking at uh, what is around it, uh, looking at the behavior of the other turkeys, it cannot even imagine Thanksgiving. So for the turkey, Thanksgiving is a black swan. For the farmer, not necessarily. So the black swan, again, as we have said a lot of times in this course, the black swan has a strong component of subjectivity. So the subjectivity is always there. Again, I'm sorry if you believe in objectivity, but unfortunately, subjectivity is much more present than what you might think. So a black swan, if you read the book by Taleb, is an event that is extreme and in terms of magnitude and impact, whose probability cannot be known in advance. So you cannot even think most of the times about the event itself. And there is the so-called hindsight component. So it's a type of event that after the happening of the event, then you start figuring out, oh, maybe I should have thought about that. This type of event is not what we consider here. Here we consider extremes, that is to say maxima or minima, that are for sure extremely rare, whose impact can be enormous, catastrophic for us, but we have enough knowledge to play with probabilities. So to model the event. A black swan is an event that cannot be modeled, that cannot be expected, that cannot be forecast. An extreme is something that we can try to manage, that we can try to forecast. Okay? So it's a fundamental difference. So please do not mix the two different concepts. So, in the previous lesson, we have said that the GV, the generalized extreme value distribution, and the GPD, the generalized Pareto distribution, represents the limiting distributions that we use in extreme value theory when studying the behavior of maxima. We will see that we will have normalized maxima in one situation and the so-called exceedances in the other. Now, we have also seen that the GV and the GPD are the outcomes of different approaches to data. We have cited the block maxima approach and the peaks over threshold approach. Now, let's say something basic about these two different approaches. Imagine to have a time series, okay? In reality, the time component is not fundamental. We can also have a cross-sectional, a special uh, dimension. I mean, it's not very important to have just observations over time. We could have really observations in space, observations in, according to whatever set of uh, index. I mean, from my financial mathematics, you probably remember that we can always define a stochastic process where the different random variables are just indexed with respect to a particular uh, set of indices, okay? So from a mathematical point of view, taking into consideration time is not fundamental, but it helps us in understanding what's going on. So let's assume that we have a time series. So we have this sequence of observations over time. Now, there are two ways of approaching the problem of maxima in this time series. Now, there are different ways in which we can actually compute and look at the different maxima in the time series so that we can have enough observations to model the behavior of the maxima. Now, in the block maxima approach, as the name suggests, what we do, we take our time series or we take our observations and we collect the observations into blocks. 
So we split, for example, our time series into blocks. Once we have the different blocks, in each block we take the maximum value if we want the maxima or the minimum value if we want the minima. So if we split our time series into 10 blocks, we compute for each block the maximum and we end up with 10 maxima. Okay, so this is very trivially the block maxima approach. Now, the problem of the approach, as you can imagine, is how to define the blocks. So, unfortunately, there are uh, no golden rules. So, it's not that there is a, a silver bullet that tells you how to define the blocks. There are different heuristics that we can consider, uh, but obviously you can imagine that there is a compromise between the size of the blocks and the amount of maxima that you can get. The, the smaller the blocks, the more maxima you can obtain from your sample, but uh, the smaller the blocks, also the less reliable the maxima that you get. So there is really this trade-off uh, there are different solutions. You can think, for example, of rolling blocks with some correction. You can also think in some situations of blocks of different size, but you need to be very careful in that situation. There are a few possibilities that we will consider later in the course when we play with actual data. So for the moment, I just postpone the problem of the size of the blocks to the point in which we will actually play with real data. So for the moment it is just sufficient to say that we have a series of observations and we split the observations into blocks and for each block we take the maximum value so that we have a collection of maxima. Given this collection of maxima, if properly normalized using the constants an and bn that we have seen last time, then the limiting distribution of these normalized maxima is actually a GEV, so it's a generalized extreme value distribution. In the peaks of a threshold approach, as the name suggests, we do something different. We set a threshold level and we only consider those observations that are above the threshold. We will call those observations exceedances. In particular, we will consider the so-called excess. The excess is nothing more than the difference between the value of the observation and the threshold. So, assume that an observation is 20, my threshold is 8, so I'm considering the observation because 20 is larger than 8, but the excess is 20 minus 8, that is to say 12. This is what we call the excess. So in the peaks of a threshold, we consider the peaks, that is to say, all the observations that are above the threshold we set. When we use the peaks of a threshold approach, the beautiful theorem by Pekins, Balkma, and Dehan tells us that if the threshold we set is high enough, so is large enough, and here as for the block maxima, the problem was related to the size of the blocks. Here, the problem is to define the correct level of the threshold, but the theorem tells us that if we set the correct threshold, then the exceedances can be modeled safely using a generalized Pareto distribution. This is an extremely important theorem and result because it tells us that essentially we will see all tails if we set the correct threshold level can be approximated with the tail of a generalized Pareto distribution. Let's consider a very simple and silly example. Imagine that I am the professor in a classroom and I want to collect the maxima in my class in order to be modeled according to the results of extreme value theory. And I know that I can use two approaches, the block maxima and the peaks of a threshold. Now, how can I do 
to define the maxima that I will model using EDT. Under the block maxima approach, what I can do, if I know that, for example, my students are sitting at tables of four students for each table, I can just say that each table represents a block, and for each table, I will select the tallest student. Okay, in that way, I will have, for example, in the picture you see two tables and I will have two students that will represent my maxima for the analysis. If I consider the same classroom, but I want to set a threshold, I can say that I want to consider all students that are at least as tall as my bow tie. Typically, when I teach in class, I do wear a bow tie here at my place is a little bit strange so I'm not doing that but trust me I have a lot of bow ties so let's assume that I want to select all students that are at least as tall as my bow tie for whatever strange reason that uh, can be. Uh, what you immediately observe is that in this situation the number of students I select is no longer two as for the block maxima but five. What is very important to stress is that using the block maxima or using the peaks of a threshold typically leads to different sets of observations that we will use for the analysis. What we know from the theory, from extreme value theory, is that if we set the blocks correctly and we set the threshold correctly, in the limit, the results that we can get from one approach or the other will be compatible. We will see that there is a different way in which we give the interpretation to the results, also because in one case we are considering the maxima, in the other one we are considering the exceedances and the excesses, so they are not exactly the same kind of things, but we will see that the results are actually compatible. So there is a an important connection between the GEV and the GPD. So the next step in our lesson is to discuss the two theorems, that is to say the Pickens bulk mother Hahn theorem for what concerns the peaks of a threshold and the GPD, and the Fischer-Tippe theorem for what concerns conversely the generalized extreme value distribution that we will see includes different sub situations and the block maxima approach. In modeling we will see that very often we will tend to prefer the GPD because in the literature we find more results and for example for what concerns the GPD there are also very useful forms of regression that can be used. So at least for what concerns my personal preferences the the peaks of a threshold and the GPD approximation of the tail uh, are in practice a little bit more useful, at least in our field in quantitative risk management, than the block maxima. That nevertheless can be extremely important and powerful in other fields of application. That's why we will give a little bit more attention uh, to the GPD instead of the GEV.